I made this uh, entry table out of gum wood. I'll explain the wood in the video. Uh, it features 32 mortise and tenon joints, uh, which in this case I made with the Panther router simply because it makes that kind of joinery really efficient, uh, accurate, and fast. You could do it with loose tenon joinery. You could also uh, hand cut them. Uh, but since I really wanted to explore what the Panther router could do, I uh, chose to use it. I uh, hope you enjoy the video, and if you have any questions, just ask. Let's just do this. So I've got a load of gum, a really big load of gum. Uh, gum's not really used anymore, either as a primary wood or a secondary wood in furniture making or cabinet making. Uh, it was used a long time ago when most work was hand work. Uh, the reason folks don't use it anymore is the grain has a tendency to, to undulate and it's also, uh, you know, the color is variable. Uh, and that undulating grain means it's really difficult to work with uh, modern power methods where you're simply using a machine uh, to send it through. Uh, I think it's very attractive uh, and you know, right now I've got a lot of it, so I'm going to use it for this project. Where I live in Virginia, uh, gum is typically destined for the fireplace or the paper mill. Uh, I, I've got a local sawmill that uh, is actually down in North Carolina that I went and got a, a big load of hickory for a future kitchen project that I'm letting dry for a few years. Uh, I buy most of my wood wet sawn uh, from the lumber yard and then air dry it. Uh, this was free, basically. So a load maybe five times this size uh, was, hey, if you'll get rid of it, you can take it. Uh, so let's see what we can do with this uh, formerly uh, uh, praised wood and that's fallen out of favor. Uh, see if we can mill up some that... Uh... First up is a rough cut. This stuff is uh, pretty twisty. There's a lot of tension still in it, so you got to take your time. After rough cut, the uh, prep is the standard joining, planing. Uh, I'll skip most of that since it's pretty standard stuff at this point. Off the plane, I cut everything to finish with. After planing and cutting, you can see the uh, really fantastic variety of colors in the wood. Uh, there's chocolates, browns, vanillas, a lot of rust. Uh, it's very intriguing. Can't wait to get a finish on it. First step, though, was to glue up four legs, and I'm just using basic three-quarter stock to make leg stock. I also need to glue up the wider panels for the top and the shelves. And uh, the glue up trick I use is I sandwich the two pieces together and plane them together to make uh, an even face and then glue that face together. The glued legs as well as the glued up shelf and top stock get planed again uh, to even up the glue joints. So with a little bit of work, the uh, stack of rough lumber goes to uh, some uh, fairly dimensional pieces, uh, glued up legs, top, two shelves, long stringers, and uh, front and back material. Next step is to get everything to length, uh, just cut a clean edge off, 
and then position that pin and then jump against the stop to make the final cut. All right, so with the uh, cross cutting, that gives us narrow, short rails for the sides, long, short rails for the top of the sides, top of the casework long narrow rails for the drawer opening on the front and narrow rails for the uh, shelf supports and then a wide rail for the back fork legs these look nice uh, and material for top and two shelves and I haven't cross cut these to length yet because I want to wait and see exactly what's required when uh, the uh, case is done. I'm mocking up the mortises so I know how long I can make the tenons. In this case I'm going to make them an inch but I've got to miter the edge where they meet. I've marked out the center <clears throat> of each mortise with a little mark and I've uh, shared it across all the pieces at one time. The mortise isn't in the center, as you can see, the mark, well this one's probably easier to see, um, isn't in the center, it's off to the side. I'm trying to keep as much depth as I can as two of them come in at each other. The, the more I move it out to the edge, the more room there'll be. The Panta router is a router table where you move the router instead of the workpiece. And so here I am setting up the height of the router. Take this off so we can see positioned the, the template jig such that it will hit the center line the mortise hole and at the center of the bit is where we marked before and it should in theory make a one inch pennant. I'll bring around to the other side and I can show you how we're going to do the depth. This is zero with us pressed up against the stock. And I want to cut the tenon slightly deeper. I mean I want to cut the mortar slightly deeper. So I'll go an inch and a little more than a sixteenth. I won't bore you with endless footage of a panto router working. I do want to show how, how you accomplish what you're doing though. So here's a few sped up clips uh, of what it does in the sense that you've got a couple of templates. You can see them both on the, the right side there as it goes in. Uh, that lets you cut matched mortises or tenons out at the same time. And it's very repeatable. Uh, it's also very quick as I'm showing in this clip to change uh, position to the next set of holes. A router table where you move the piece, I'm, I'm sorry, the router instead of the piece, is ideally suited to making holes of a specific depth or a specific length, uh, or cutting the ends of pieces, which you'll see when we go to make the tenons. Since this piece has 32 mortise and tenons, I figured it was a good example of what the Panta router could do, and I think it's the perfect tool to make this work. Without moving the templates, the, uh, the setup for the tenons is almost identical. Uh, work holding is slightly different. Uh, I do scribe a line with a marking gauge uh, so that the uh, cut in the board is as clean as I can get it. Here's a different angle of how it works, and you can also see on the top left the two templates it follows. Though I haven't shown the glue up of this piece yet, I did want to show how the uh, Panda router 
makes cutting tenons or mortises for that matter out of uh, or into assembled pieces uh, really convenient. Otherwise I would have had to pre-measure and make that stretcher piece really accurate so that these tenons would fit into those two mortises cut. Even though I've got two templates installed, you don't have to use them both. Here I'm just using one uh, to cut the tenon on the edge of the short stop. Okay, I've got to bevel each stretcher. This is as good a point as any to uh, put the taper on the legs, so I just drew a line in on two sides. Uh, I think I came in uh, about three quarters of an inch and just simply smoothed up the bandsaw cut. No need to make a complex taper and jig or something this small. Since I'm using a face frame style front, I've got to have something for the drawers to sit in. And here I am putting a quarter inch slot in the parts that will be glued into the face frame. These will hold drawer runners uh, made out of maple. And speaking of the face frame, uh, we showed putting the, the uh, tenons in earlier, but here is gluing up the face frame with those slots cut for drawer runners. I like to clamp some parts down to the bench as well to make them extremely flat if I can. My design has each of the stretchers uh, with a nice gentle curve, uh, so I'm laying out a curve that looks pleasing to the eye with simply a flexible rod held in place with some nails. I cut and smooth the first one and I'm using that to mark all the others so they're all reasonably the same. I cut the arcs in the short and long stretchers with a bandsaw. I also put an arc in the face frame. I put the same arc in the wide side pieces. I fared and sanded one of each type of piece and then used that as a template uh, with a patterning bit to smooth out the others. Uh, for the little pieces, I'm just doing it in one pass as I'm not terribly worried about tear out. See, that's an uphill cut there. Uh, those pieces are so easy to remake, and I made extra. Uh, it wasn't that uh, big of a deal. For the longer pieces, however, uh, and the front face frame or the side top rails, uh, I went ahead and cut it in two passes to avoid a climb cut and not have tear out issues. I simply changed the bit uh, to one with a top bearing and cut the second half of uh, the patterning job. You'll see that one here, there's the top bearing bit. First dry fit to see the lay of the land with the arcs that were cut in. Uh, the 16 mortises and tenons fit really nicely. That's the advantage of the Panta router for a piece like this. I think it allows for a great deal of accuracy and weight savings because you can thin out your project. I also need that same quarter inch hole on the back, or a quarter inch slot rather, on the back so that the drawer slides can have a place to go. I can't cut them on the router because it's a long, awkward piece, uh, but I've marked out where the drawers land and I'm chiseling out that slot. All the rails got a, uh, and the uh, side and face frame got a quarter inch round over. One more dry fit, and I'm measuring the length of the drawer slides I've got to make. The drawers slide on simple maple uh, assemblies that slip into those slots made earlier. With everything cut, it's time for probably my least favorite part, but it's not bad. Uh, it's the smoothing, so it's time to get out the uh, scrapers, sandpaper, and uh, sharp plane blades.
My MO is uh, every surface gets planed, then, then scraped if needed. Um, if, if the grain runs well and there's not a lot of uh, divots, knots, or other issues in a piece, uh, scraping is not required. But if it does need scraping, especially if it was a, a glued up joint or similar, uh, scraped, and then I go over it with 220 grit sandpaper. This is an example where you have to scrape uh, the two pieces glued up, the grain's running in different directions, so I've got to scrape it. Sometimes glue up is uh, like herding cats. This one's pretty simple. There's really no hurry. There's only four uh, glue joints on each side. Uh, get them wet. Uh, get them at least started because they're pretty, pretty tight joints. Uh, and then you can put some clamping pressure on it. I'm gluing up two halves, the front and the back. To finish the drawer slides, it's just gluing on another quarter inch piece of maple on the bottom of that piece that will go in uh, that will hold the drawer to ride on. Carcass glue up is the two sides plus another uh, 16 mortise joints, uh, but like before, they're tight enough that the piece really holds itself in alignment and you don't have to do any complex positioning. While the carcass was drying, I milled up some blanks for drawer stock, and here I'm using my sled to get good true cuts uh, on the sides. I've got two fronts, two backs, and four sides. There's thousands of videos on YouTube about cutting do dovetails, and I'm certainly no teacher. Um, I cut them the way I cut them, and that starts with the divider method to get a spacing that I like. Uh, once I have that, I'll go ahead and transfer it to the piece. For the tail section, I'll score all four sides and putting an especially deep score on the two ends to, to help with cutting a little trough for the saw. I use 11 degrees, so I set my sliding bevel to 11 and mark these in. These are just rough. Wherever they're cut, they're cut, and you'll see later that it doesn't line up. Why I said it's just a mark is I cut my tails on the table saw. I've tried all kinds of different methods from hand saw to band saw. This is the method that cuts absolutely perfect tails every time. Uh, you make a cut, you flip, you make a cut, you rotate, you make a cut. You can cut four cuts for each one, and assuming all of your parts are cut the same, uh, you can cut all of your tail cuts uh, for your entire project right away. So using that extra deep scribe line, we'll go ahead and make a little place for the saw to rest uh, to get the first waste cut off the outside. A saw, or be it a hand saw or the table saw, can't cut into that angle. Uh, so you do have some pairing cleanup uh, for, for that edge cut. I gang cross 
process the uh, cleaning. Uh, I'll just stack them all up. I'll get them all rough cut to uh, less than an eighth of an inch to the line. And I'll go in and make finish cuts at a slight uh, number. A small amount of paring cleans up where you had to chisel out the waste. For the pins, I mark the front and the back. Uh, you, some say mark it lightly, but I like to be able to see it, and it doesn't bother me that it shows in the finished piece. I use a multi-purpose two-inch block to hold the uh, pin board level and to make a little place to set the tailboard. I use tape over the marking line to to make sure it lines up square, and then I mark the tail locations on the pin board. And I'll transfer those tail locations down to the gauge line. I'm not a good sawer, but uh, I make sure the board's level, it helps. I'm not afraid to do some pairing. Uh, I know a lot of folks like saw to fit, uh, but uh, if I have to cut a little bit, I'm not going to do that. So I try and stay a fraction of I usually rough out the waste uh, with a coping saw, but since I'm only making two drawers, I figured I'd just chop them out. So uh, with the tailstock, uh, a little bit less than an eighth away from the gauge line and just rough cut everything uh, all the way through and then do a finish cut per normal. I apologize that the uh, camera's on the bench and every time I whack the mallet it shakes, but here it is. It's uh, straight in. Give yourself some setback angle and work your way down about halfway. Turn it over, the back side's about the same. The only difference is, is on these initial cuts, uh, I don't undercut, I actually lean uh, the opposite direction while I'm roughing it out. Why? Uh, it's easy to break off the uh, residue of the waste in your pin board and you end up with, uh, you know, broken pieces versus cut. So I'll tilt the other way while I'm doing the rough cutting and then here you'll see I do the undercut. And we'll do a rough fit, uh, give us an idea of where we need to clean up. And a test fit of the drawer slot pieces. So when I lay out drawers, I uh, label each drawer part uh, letters. This is A, 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 B, 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 B. Uh, that lets me make sure I'm fitting them correctly uh, together. Also number each joint. One goes to one, two to two, three to three, four to four. Um, I've made a lot of drawers where I have fitted the wrong pieces together just because, you know, when, when you're making uh, a piece of casework with, with eight drawers, it's really easy to get them mixed up. The other thing I do always is after I lay them out, I place a mark on the bottom inside of each drawer uh, so I know the orientation is always correct. So when I'm assembling the dovetails or cutting them, I'm matching uh, letter to letter, number to number, and being sure that these are on the same side. That's going to help me now 
and these have the same mark as I go to cut the uh, slot for the bottom uh, of the drawer. We've got to make a slot that goes into the tail uh, for the bottom, so it actually starts ahead of the, the, the part of the side. And the pin board, it doesn't matter, uh, so you can just do a through, through cut there. Sorry about the camera angle here. It, it, it must have drooped down, uh, or I thought I'd be working lower, um, given my height. I don't know why I think that, but I milled up some uh, drawer bottoms out of uh, poplar-lined MDF quarter-inch plywood. It's really great stuff, uh, and here I am simply putting glue on the long grain surfaces, uh, slipping the bottom in, and hammering the joint closed. I like to put drawers in while the glue is still wet, so I can nudge the drawer to fit in its final home if needed, uh, but I also check square to be sure I'm not doing anything funny. And since this will be a, a, a flush fit drawer, uh, I'm taking advantage of it while the glue can still be moved around to work on the alignment of the drawer directly to the front. With the carcass glued up, we can go ahead and final cut the shelves and the top. top gets a similar arc, uh, much like the, uh, the stretchers or rails on the front and sides, which I cut out with the bandsaw. Outer curves are really easy to fare with just a hand plane, so uh, the top and the shelves got fared. Final fitting of the drawers and cleanup. I still haven't uh, attached a couple of my Bozo dovetails since I hadn't picked up a saw in a few months. I was rusty. All right, I glued some uh, stop blocks to the back and I'm just verifying that the drawers fit flush to the face frame. The shelves get a cut out to fit around the legs. And the shelves also get the same uh, simple curve or arc on the front. Since this is uh, uh, really figured wood, I've got a lot of little knot holes and a few uh, oopses to fill. The epoxy gets leveled easily with a card scraper. The shelves and top go through uh, finished sanding and finished planing. Here I'm getting the ingrain smooth enough to take a finish. Uh, these are all the parts with finished sanding done, ready for the sealer. Uh, this is with one coat of General Finishes Seal a Cell. And this is the uh, first coat of General Finishes uh, Armor Seal going on. And the second coat, this using a white pad. Uh, to rub on a very thin layer. Third coat. Since the finish is done, I can go ahead and put the anchors in to attach the top. I'm using the same figure eight bolts that I think everybody uses. They're fantastic.
once attached to the carcass, they can uh, hold the top on. I pre-drilled the top, but didn't show it. And man, I needed an extra long screwdriver. And that's the gum entry table. I certainly appreciate you watching. I wish you success on all of your projects. And if you have any questions about the tools or the things I showed in the video, just ask.